And uh, Paul begins by talking about the fact that we have a, a debt to owe, uh, and it's a debt of love. And uh, as I uh, uh, read about what that really means and thought about what it really means, it kind of reminded me of a bad credit card debt. It's one of those that uh, you always owe, but you never get paid off. I hope you don't have one of those, but it uh, can happen. Uh, Neil McGregor, in his book, History of the World and 100 Objects, chronicles objects that had the greatest impact uh, on, uh, uh, on human life uh, in terms of history. And the credit card made, made the list, number, number 99. Uh, and he says of it that, a, that a credit cards have become the ultimate symbol of economic freedom. But there's a dark side, McGregor writes. There is little doubt at all that paying by credit card does increase our willingness to spend often more than we can afford. And we go uh, in debt, uh, and, uh, which is not a good thing, of course. Uh, but there is a debt, Paul says, that we all owe, and it's a debt uh, to love. Uh, we'd certainly say this is a difficult command. Now, again, in context, back at, at the beginning of this very practical section, it's present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a picture of the burnt offering, commitment, dedication to the Lord, uh, knowing what we know in terms of God's grace, being saved, being justified, uh, and so forth, knowing all those things were to do that. Uh, and then he goes on, he says, and then our mind should be renewed. And it's really in this passage he begins to come back and deal with that, uh, that issue. And that's where we're going to go in the third uh, portion of the, of the message. Uh, but we covered what genuine love is and does. Uh, but this is really more of an attitude uh, about love. Uh, and certainly important to understand the motivation as well. So it's a difficult command to love others. Uh, the early church uh, did it well, but certainly had their failings, uh, and uh, we probably do it well at times. Uh, but if we did a better job of it, if we could take Romans 12 uh, and 13 and live them out, it would certainly revolutionize uh, our lives, our church, and probably uh, the community around us. Uh, Jesus said, all men will know that you're my disciples, true disciples, if uh, we love one another. Well, that's where Paul's at here. The commitment that we owe, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of uh, of the law. So we'd say first about this commitment that we need to understand we have a, a debt uh, to, uh, to love. And uh, uh, it just, uh, we almost have to say what this passage is, is not saying. This passage is not uh, a passage about finances. And some people lift it out of context and focus on the idea that Christians should never be uh, in, uh, in debt uh, because he says, owe no one anything. It's just an illustration. It's just an illustration to help us understand what it is that we're supposed to uh, to owe, and that is uh, this idea of love. So we get this attitude or, or this thinking uh, that we'll kind of uh, uh, explain here in a moment. But uh, again, debt is when you uh, can't make your payments. Uh, debt is when your liabilities are greater than your assets. Uh, but uh, in Matthew 5:42, Jesus says, "Give to him who asks you." And from him who wants to borrow from you, don't do it because Christians are never in debt. No, actually, it says from you, do not turn away. Uh, in Matthew 25 and Luke 19, uh, there's uh, references to banking and investing and borrowing and lending. Uh, and in the Old Testament, it actually spells out rules and principles for borrowing and for, uh, for lending. So this is not about borrowing or not, not borrowing. And uh, I must just have to say that just because of... Uh, uh, some of the background things I've read and other, uh, uh, other people I've heard uh, pull this thing out of context. It's not good to go in debt, obviously. Proverbs, there's lots of warnings about it. But this is about a mindset, a thinking. If you borrowed money from somebody, you owe somebody 500 bucks, and, uh, and you see them walking down the street, you're not just thinking, hey, there's George. Hope he's having a good day. No, you're thinking like, oh, man, that's right. Oh, that guy, 500 bucks. Holy mackerel. Okay, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to say, uh, you know, it's like, hey, I'm going to, the money's coming. 
course, none of you have ever owed anyone money. I'm not talking about real life experience for myself. But, uh, uh, you know, that if you see them, in case this has never been your case, I'm just explaining it to you. When you see them, that's what you think about. You think about the debt. You think about what you owe them. That's Paul's idea. When you see someone, your neighbor, neighbor, a person of another kind, not, not just somebody that you know, somebody you're familiar with, somebody that's like you, uh, it, it's somebody that's different than you, somebody you may not even know well. When you see them coming, you are to think in your mind, oh, there's that person. I owe them. I, it's a debt of love. Uh, why, why do I owe them a debt? Because of the love that God's given me. Really, the debt is owed to God. Paul says we pay it uh, by the way that, uh, that we love others. Uh, and so it's important. I think it's a great uh, uh, idea to have in our mind to help us remember to love others. Origen wrote in the second century that uh, Paul's desire that our debt of love should remain and never cease to be owed. For it is expedient that we should both pay this debt and always owe the debt. I'm sorry, I just read that. I had to think about credit cards. And sometimes that's the way it is there. It seems like you're always paying them and you always got to pay them. Uh, but uh, hopefully you're never in that situation. But, um, but that's the idea of this love. Uh, it's a mindset. It's an attitude so that when I see someone else, I, I, don't, I don't think of how can I avoid that person? No, it's what is the debt that I have to them? Oh, that's right. It, it's a debt of love that I have. It's a personal debt that I have to them. Uh, because of what God has done for me. Uh, and secondly, he says, if we do this, this commitment, it fulfills the law. Love one another is pretty basic to, uh, to Christianity. It's in John 13 that Jesus says, a new commandment that I give you, uh, love one another. Uh, it's not, uh, it means new in type, uh, new in kind that we would love uh, in, a, in an unconditional way. Uh, and Paul says, in doing this, it fulfills the law. Now, you remember the Ten Commandments uh, are bas were basically on two tablets. And a portion of, of them dealt with our relationship uh, with God. Have no other gods before me. Don't commit idolatry and so forth. It had to do with, though, we'd say, uh, our vertical relationship with God. Uh, the other tablet dealt with our relationship with other people. It begins with honoring your father and mother, and then there's five others after it. These are the five that Paul uh, mentions here. Uh, and he basically says, again, because of what Jesus says in Matthew 22, that if we do these things, we've actually fulfilled the law. Here's the words of Jesus about that in Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. And again, law and prophets would mean all of the Old Testament, all of the Jewish Bible. Uh, if you can do these things. Now notice Paul here, as we get into it, doesn't even deal with the issue of your love for God. There's an assumption that you love God. He's just kind of, you guys are believers. I'm writing to you as believers. I know that you love God. Let's deal with the other part of the equation. Uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, if you do that, then you fulfill uh, the law. And he gives some examples. Uh, the right of marriage. Uh, when you love your neighbor, you'll refrain from adultery. Uh, the right to life. When you love your neighbor, neighbor you'll regard his life. Uh, the right of property. When you love your neighbor, you'll respect his ownership and his property. The right of truth. Uh, you won't bear false witness uh, against your neighbor. The right of ownership deals with uh, the command not to covet. Uh, so Paul's saying that if you love your neighbors, there are certain things that you're not going to do because you're going to see them and say, I have a debt to them. What is that debt? It's a debt to love. Why do I owe it? Well, it's actually I owe it to God. He's done so much for me. It's the least I can do to, uh, to love them. Uh, and when I don't do that, I could end up doing one of these things. Uh, of this idea of covenant, Paul says in Colossians 3, 5, there he says, therefore put to death your members, which are on the earth, and that's not church members, that's uh, members of your body. You see, I just thought I'd mention that. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice that covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these uh, things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, 
in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. You used to be like this, but you're no longer like this. Uh, if you do these things like covetousness, it's like idolatry. Why? Because it comes between you and your relationship with God. Those things that you want, that other people have, or that you see, they have that. I like that house. I wish I had it instead of them. That car, I wish I had that car instead of them. Uh, that kind of thinking, he says, you're putting an idol in your life, and certainly uh, it's not loving your neighbor when you do uh, any of these things. Uh, you know, again, it's easy to convince uh, you know, folks uh, sitting in the, uh, the chair next to you how much you love God and so forth. But the real test, of course, is when we're out there uh, in the world. And the world, the world is starving for someone to come along and say that uh, somebody cares, cares about them. I, I can just tell you from my own life, I was so ready to get saved, I finally just led myself to the Lord. I just was so convicted, and uh, I finally just got down on my knees in my bedroom, and I prayed the sinner's prayer and, and led me to the Lord. I was my first convert. Uh, of course, we don't save anybody. God saves us. Uh, but I thought about that before, and uh, I'm pretty sure that if, that if anybody had walked up to me in the weeks or maybe the, the month or whatever it was, that period of time where, man, I'm just, the wheels are spinning. I'm going through all this in my mind. If anyone had come up to me and, and just uh, reminded me of God's love and asked me if I wanted to pray, I would have prayed. <laughs> I was just so ready. There are people out there that are just, uh, it's not a very caring world. Uh, and people pretty much are in their own little zone. They have these little things plugged into their ears. They're pretty much glued to this little thing down uh, down here, and I have those, and I have this, and the bigger one too, and uh, they're pretty handy tools, but uh, uh, they can get us so occupied we forget that there's actually other people uh, in the world. An extreme case of this was in the Chicago Tribune a number of years ago, a woman named Mary Hannigan. Uh, she was uh, rear-ended intentionally by a guy on an off-ramp on the freeway there in Chicago. Uh, he jumped out of his car with a knife, just a random thing, and began uh, attacking her. Uh, people around her responded by driving around so they could get off the off-ramp. Nobody stopped, nobody honked their horn, nobody said anything, nothing. Uh, she ended up with uh, plastic surgery, 100 stitches uh, in her face. Her husband said later, that's what I can't believe. It's as if people went out of the way not to help her. And uh, of course, that's an extreme case. Uh, but there's just people out there uh, that are hoping that someone somewhere uh, will show some kindness or care for them. Uh, and again, the idea here in our neighbor, uh, it's someone of a different kind, a different type. It's not somebody we normally hang out with. It's just the, the general person that's out there uh, that we need to show God's love to. Uh, so there's a commitment that we owe. It's a debt that we owe, and we're never, we need to constantly be paying it, but we're never going to pay it off, and it's a debt of love. And again, it's because of the love that we've come to know God. Paul doesn't even address, again, the idea of our relationship with God. The assumption is we've got one, and we've already come to know God's love, so now he deals with this other area. He adds to that in verse 11, saying there's a crisis of time uh, itself. And he says, and do this. Knowing the time, that is high time to awake out of sleep, uh, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent uh, and the day is at hand. So the, the crisis is a lack of time. Uh, there's uh, this idea of uh, uh, urgency in, in the word time uh, and, uh, and do this, understanding the present time. There's two Greek words that he could have used uh, here for time. One is chrono, as in chronolo chronological, like calendar time, linear time. Uh, that's not the word that he used. He uses karyos, uh, which is a quality or a kind of time. He's saying, do you know the kind of times that we're living in now? Because they're coming very quickly. The kind of time we're living in now is called the church age. It's called the last days. Uh, Paul was very concerned about it in the first century. Think we ought to be concerned <laughs> in the days that we're, we're living in uh, now? This idea that Jesus could return for the church, the rapture of the church, at any moment, the imminent return of Jesus Christ, well, you'll find it with the apostles. You'll find it with the early church fathers. You'll find it with the great men and women of God through the centuries all lived with this idea and this concept 
that the Lord could come uh, at, uh, at any time, that we're truly living in the last days. C.E.B. Cranefield once said, this present age, which Paul refers to as the night, could never have been a higher status than that of something far spent. Henceforth, the day would always be imminent until it should finally break. This brings an urgency to the matter of loving on the level. Believers are to wake up from a spiritual lethargy and love their neighbors while they have the opportunity to do so. The idea, you see that person coming, he's your neighbor, you owe him a debt, it's a debt of love, and, you might, and you've got a little window of opportunity to show that love. Because today, we're closer to our salvation to be with the Lord than we were yesterday. We're not getting further away, we're getting closer uh, every day. And we don't know when that time uh, might become. And it's meant to be a, a change of attitude or to recognize that we kind of wake up uh, because we just, life, life gets busy. And we can kind of, we can start to think that the life is the thing and the life is, uh, uh, is, uh, is in, important. I've kind of used this uh, uh, illustration before, but uh, uh, one of my uh, favorite teachers in graduate school would point out to us, a great Old Testament scholar, uh, the idea that uh, this type in the Bible, that the great men of God were all shepherds, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, David, and so forth. And he contrasts that with the Canaanites who are primarily farmers. It's nothing against farmers, uh, but he points out a lifestyle difference between these two people. Farmers live season to season, season to season. There's a time to plant, there's a time to harvest, and, it, and it, it's very cyclic, it's season by season by season. Kind of like your work week, you know, it's just like this. But he said the great men and women of God never lived that way. They lived like shepherds. Shepherds are always on a journey. They're always going from point A to point B. They are leaving here and they are arriving here. And we can get caught up in a cyclic kind of, uh, well, here comes the weekend again. Man, another week has come and gone. Man, here's a, you know. And we start to think that life is like this, and it's not. We are on a journey, and it's going to end. And it's going to end at the rapture of the church, or when we go to be with the Lord, if that happens prior to the rapture of the church, but it's going to end. This window of opportunity called the church age, uh, we're in a crisis of time, and if we see it that way, Paul said this should be an, an urgency to actually loving others. Kind of uh, told you uh, this illustration before, but it's kind of become a household phrase with us. Uh, the little boy that liked to visit his grandparents and when he would dare, Love to listen to the grandfather clock uh, out in the hallway uh, to, a ch to uh, its chiming. Uh, and he would love to be there at noon so he'd get to hear it at least 12 times. Uh, and he was there one day on a Saturday afternoon. The clock went and he counted out loud. One, two. He goes all the way three and then it hits 12 and it goes. He didn't know the clock. They were having trouble with the clock. The clock went 13, 14, 15 and finally stopped. He was very excited and he was very concerned. He ran into his grandmother and said, Grandmother, it's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> and, uh, and it is. It's, uh, and so here's the punchline. So that's what Kathy and I say to each other when we're running a little late, like getting to church on Sunday mornings. What time is it, hon? Later than it's ever been before. <laughs> and, uh, and it is now. And that's Paul's point in the first century so much more in our day today. The crisis requires, again, this idea of a change of attitude. Uh, his illustration, the metaphor, we're awake as opposed to uh, being, uh, we're falling asleep when we should be uh, awake. He uses it in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, uh, and really talking about the, uh, the rapture of the church and that we should wake up. Uh, there he says, uh, therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, uh, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together uh, with him. Time is running out. The rapture of the church God didn't appoint us for wrath. We're not going through the tribulation. He could come for us at uh, any time. Uh, Peter uses the same idea in 2 Peter 3 about the return of Christ. Uh, there he says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. 
Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Somebody asks you if you believe in global warming, you can tell them as a believer, you absolutely do. It's right in the Bible. Uh, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which, glory, uh, which righteousness dwells. Uh, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Uh, we should keep that in mind. Uh, everything around us is going to be gone. The only thing that will pass into eternity are people in God's word. Maybe we should invest ourselves uh, into those things. Uh, but it's coming quickly. The emphasis on the imminent return uh, of Jesus Christ. The light is dawning. I think a new day is coming. That's what Paul's saying. Our ability, our chance, our chance to love someone uh, is, is just that. Uh, it's a crisis of time. It's a moment. Sometimes it's only once. You know, a lot of people you meet, you don't see them every day. Uh, your little words of kindness or whatever it might be, uh, uh, sharing the love of God, you, you don't know the, uh, the impact that it uh, may have on them uh, and then on, the, on someone else. Uh, but Paul says we need to have this idea that there's a crisis of time, there's a debt that I owe, uh, and it's because God has loved me so greatly. Thirdly, all of that should change our behavior. There at the end of verse 12, he says, Therefore, because of what he's just written, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So uh, three times he uses the phrase, let us. It's an exhortation, an exhortation to change. Uh, and the first one is uh, change involves things we should not do or to cast off darkness. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, it's the darkness, uh, the temptation that the, uh, the devil or the enemy brings our way. Uh, James 4, 7, James writes uh, about this subject. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, that's our word, and he will flee from you, draw near to God, and he will draw uh, near to you. Uh, there's things of the darkness. Again, another metaphor. We're people of the light, so we don't dwell in the darkness. Things we should cast off, things that we should resist, uh, because, uh, again, the Dawn is about ready to come over the horizon. Secondly, the change involves a strength that we do not have. I see that in this little phrase, and let us put on the armor of light. The armor of light, uh, that's the armor that God would give us. None of these things that he's going to be describing, this change uh, is not really something we do. It's something God does in us. It's by his strength, kind of the classic uh, uh, Billy Graham line, and I, I don't do a good Billy Graham, so I won't even try, but uh, he would say the Christian life is impossible unless you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. Opens this coat. Unless you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. It is impossible. And it's impossible except by God's power to transform us and change us. Paul's pointing out some motivation here, why we should do it. He's pointing out a crisis of time. Uh, but there's some changes, but we need the Lord's protection. We need God's hand of strength upon us. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 16 to, uh, to walk in the spirit. And I think that's what we all want to try to do. Uh, but there's also a very fine line between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. You go out here today, the last song that we sing, <clears throat> still ringing in your ears, praising God for what he's going to do and how we might use you to love others until the guy cut you off right over there by where Scissor used to be. You know, yeah, right, God, can't blue, well, yeah, can't blue. God bless you. you know. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real fine line between walking in the spirit uh, and walking in, in the flesh. Uh, it's, it's not easy. We need to do it uh, in the Lord's strength. Paul says in Ephesians 16, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Uh, and having done all to stand. It's uh, the armor of God. It's uh, those things that God gives to us. Uh, it's our faith and our trust in him primarily, our reliance upon him that enables us to do these things. Uh, thirdly, the change involves a refusal to live like non-believers. Verse 13, let us walk properly 
uh, as, in, as in the day. Uh, this word uh, properly in the Greek uh, is a word that sounds like a schematic or scheme. Uh, it sounds very similar. Some Greek words, we just kind of say them uh, into English and they become part of our, our vo vocabulary. So let us walk with a plan, with a scheme, uh, with a plan that God has uh, for us, un unlike uh, unbelievers. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.4 uh, uses the same word when Paul says, all things should be done decently in order. It's the same, same word. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4.12, it's the idea to walk honestly, properly, honestly, decently. It's a plan. Walk in the plan that God has for us. And don't be like the non-believer. Uh, where he mentions three sinful practices or three couplets here. Uh, one of them is uh, do not, uh, uh, there must be no revelry or drunkenness. Uh, and again, just the, the person, the picture of the drunken individual. Out to have a, a, good, a good time. And, uh, and um, I'm glad that's not an issue or a problem. No, it's a big problem. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a big issue. Paul says don't act like, don't do behavior like uh, the, the non-Christian. Uh, there's to be no lewdness uh, in lust, speaking of sexual immorality. Uh, this is taken from a, a, a Greek word uh, that's the name of a city, a Selge. Selge was a Stoic city. Uh, so they were big on morality. And, uh, and so forth. Unlike many of the Roman cities that were uh, major uh, centers for prostitution and so forth, uh, Stoic City would not be like that. Selgate. Uh, Paul, he thinks that word puts an A, A, in front of it, which means the opposite. Uh, so he's saying, don't be like a person with absolutely no kind of uh, uh, morality. Uh, it's the idea that uh, uh, this is someone who's given over to immorality and they're incapable of feeling any shame. Uh, over it. Uh, and uh, if you're not sure if there's people like that, just uh, turn on the TV. Uh, it's pretty shameful, some of the stuff that's mentioned, that's said. Uh, and that's just the commercials during the news. I mean, the, the regular programming uh, uh, is really bad. Uh, but uh, Paul said there should be a contrast uh, in our lives. Uh, the third set is strife and envy. Uh, this phrase describes someone who can't stand being surpassed grudges others their successes and their positions. And, uh, and again, we've got to be careful that we're not falling into to the trap of these things. Uh, but again, it gives us uh, the solution in a sense. The change is explained thirdly or fourthly uh, with an illustration. Here's what we're to do. The word but, uh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that term in the Greek is a, uh, means uh, here's a great contrast. Instead of being like this, here's a huge contrast. Uh, instead of that, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, a phrase that Paul uses. It's one of his favorites. Put this off, put this on. He uses it uh, many times. Uh, and again, he's writing to believers. He's not saying get saved all over again. We already have the Holy Spirit. We're already in Christ. We've already come to faith in Christ. But this is different. He's saying basically by experience, in a sense, uh, put on your little bracelet that says, what would Jesus do uh, if that helps you? But it's the idea of, you're going to take Christ's presence. You're going to acknowledge Christ's presence with you uh, throughout the day. Uh, Ray Stebden uh, once wrote, he said, When I get up in the morning, I put on my clothes, intending to be part, uh, to be part of me all day. To go where I go, do what I do. They cover me. They make me presentable to others. That is the purpose of clothes. In the same way, the apostle is saying to us, Put on Jesus Christ when you get up in the morning. Make him part of your life that day. Intend that he go with you everywhere you go and that he act through you in everything you do. Call upon his resources. Live your life in Christ. Put on Jesus Christ. And then the change is explained in a word that means to plant. And we already mentioned one Greek word that means to plant. This one's a little different. Uh, there at the end it says, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust." Uh, this is one of those phrases where you, you kind of make no provision for the flesh, brother. That's right. What, what does that mean exactly? I don't know. But uh, here, here's what it means. Uh, it means don't make a plan. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, don't allow a plan to come about in your thoughts uh, or your uh, imaginations. 
Uh, someone, someone might say, the non-Christian, hey man, this weekend I can't wait because I'm planning, I'm going to do that, I'm going over here and I'm getting, we're going to get so drunk and we're going to, see he's making provision. He's making provision for the flesh. It has not happened yet, but he's making plans in his mind for something that is, uh, that is yet future. Uh, it's also a military term. Uh, and it's used to describe what we might call a FOP or a forward operating base. In other words, you, you're in, you, you establish, you get into em, en, enemy territory, we establish, our, our guys and gals do this, and then they'll set up base right there. So they got a base of operations. That's the same word. Make no provision. Don't let the flesh uh, and your fleshly self-centered desires, don't let them make a forward operating base in your brain where you sit there and now they're there and it's part of you and you're entertaining and you're thinking and you're planning and you're making provision to sin, basically. You're making provision for the flesh. You know, when we did our, our study not that long ago on spiritual warfare, my whole focus is to try to help you see that primarily most of that happens in our mind. Uh, now again, this is where the tide comes in with Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed uh, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he's kind of telling us how to do it. One of the problems we have is in our thinking and what we allow to come in our thinking and our thoughts. What am I planning on doing this weekend? What am I planning on doing tomorrow? Am I making provision? Am I considering, imagining, thinking uh, about things that are detrimental to me and that will no longer distinguish me from the non-believer, which he's just described uh, in these three, three couplets. Uh, Paul mentions this about the mind uh, here in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Again, a spiritual warfare context. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Where are those strongholds? Well, casting down arguments, thoughts that are coming to me, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of, of Christ. That's where it all begins. That's where the problem is. The problem is me and uh, in my thinking, and I need to be very, very careful. Uh, and if the thinking is habitual on something that leads me into sin, well, that's really the problem. And when it happens, I need to deal with it, realize what's going on. I may need to have other people praying for me over that issue. I may need to have some scripture that I want to put in my mind instead of those thoughts in my mind. If I can't memorize them, which you can't. I carry them in a card and review them. I might need to, well, plug those earbuds in and listen to some good worship and praise. I need to get my thoughts on Jesus Christ and not this thing that's been established in my mind. We need to bring those thoughts captive. And the Lord will do it. The Lord can help you do it. Uh, that's the whole point. What's going to happen? You'll be metamorphosis. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You don't have to... Well, we're Irish. I've always been angry. You know, I'm sorry. You know, just, you know, that's just an excuse. You know, uh, we can either, you can, you can rationalize anything. Well, I'd like to be a better Christian. It's just the way I am. Oh, well, I would say it uh, doesn't have to be that way. I've always, it doesn't matter if you've always been that way. Uh, the Lord wants to transform all of us so that we look and our behavior is different. So that when we see that person we had a debt of love to, they actually might want to talk to us. <laughs> they might be, believe that we actually are caring uh, and loving because they can see it uh, in our lives. Because we're going to put on Jesus Christ like a garment uh, and bring him with us each and every day uh, to help guard our hearts and our minds. So again, the motivation here, uh, 1 John uh, 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. That's, that's the debt. That's, that's what I, I, I want to see. I want to remember, if I'm having struggle, if I'm having a struggle forgiving somebody, I want to focus on how much God's forgiven me. If I'm having struggle loving somebody, I want to focus on how much God has, has loved me and how much he's doing for me and will continue to do for me uh, even uh, in the future. Principle can kind of be dramatically uh, uh, illustrated 
and uh, a woman's life named Catherine Laws. Her husband, Lewis, became the warden of Sing Sing Prison in 1920. Uh, she uh, led him to introduce a lot of uh, very much needed humanitarian reforms within the prison system there, which uh, eventually spread to some other prisons as well. Uh, she would, uh, in caring for these prisoners, and she did care for them, she would take her three children often and sit with the gangsters, the murderers, and the racketeers as they played basketball and baseball, and she showed them uh, true loving kindness. Uh, in 1937, they'd been there 17 years, she was tragically killed in a car accident. Uh, the next morning, the actin, acting warden uh, went to work, and at the main <coughs> gate, there were hundreds of prisoners uh, on the other side of the gate, uh, because Catherine's body in those days would be what's called a wake. In other words, you don't go to a funeral home. It's, uh, her body is actually uh, in the home uh, right there on the, uh, on the campus of, of the prison. Uh, the warden knew exactly what, uh, what they wanted. And he said to them as he opened the gate, men, I'm going to trust you. You can go to the house, uh, which they did by the hundreds. Uh, and the historical record says no count was taken, no guards were posted, uh, and no one was missing that night. And then the, art, the writer of this article said this that I thought was great. Love for one who had loved them made them dependable. Love for the one who had loved them made them dependable. And if we really understand how much God has loved us, how much he does love us, and will continue to love us no matter what, it will make us dependable. That's, that's the idea. There's a commitment we owe is to love others like a debt. Uh, it's a crisis of time, uh, but we need to understand the motivation. Uh, and that motivation of God's love should also act to actually change our own behavior so we don't act like non-believers. So other people can see God has the power to change a life. People are looking, looking for someone that will care for them, uh, but they're also looking for something in life that is greater than themselves. Uh, and we have all of that in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we... Uh... Now I praise you, Lord, of all creation. You ordain the sun to rise and fall. You scattered the stars across the heavens. You come close enough
sin. We can go the highest souls where fullness flows, where the Spirit knows the red of our path, illuminated. We know. Blocking out the 
mountains and the moon and stars. This bridge of more these enemies against the stronghold and the fortress of a holy heart. My 
Your glory, God. 